I've known Lyman for a long time. I mean, uh, Haven. Uh, I don't know why I Lyman Haven. Uh, I've known Lyman for a long time. He, uh, he and I were just visiting a little bit about some of our ancestors. I know that we both had ancestors in Washington County in the 1860s. So his family's been around down in that area for a long time. Lyman, uh, I know he went to school down there. I know that he was uh, well known for being a saddle bronc rider and a bull rider in high school. And I think he won the all around uh, rodeo athlete one year down there as well. So he went on, uh, went to BYU. I think he spent some time at Dixie as well and then graduated at BYU. He came back uh, to St. George in the early 80s and, and uh, was the uh, founding editor and uh, first editor of St. George Magazine. And he has been involved with Zion National Park for quite a few years. Uh, started out with the title of the executive director of the Natural History Association, which has evolved into uh, the Zion National Park Forever project. Uh, he's the uh, husband of his wife Debbie, who is a fry from uh, Santa Clara, and they have six children. So, Lyman, come on up. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for the, the honor to uh, spend a few minutes with you. And I do count it an honor because I know who Rotarians are, and I, it started with my grandfather, Arthur K. Haven, who was one of the first and kind of founding Rotarians in the St. George area, a long, 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 clear back in the time you were talking, <laughs> the 20s. <laughs> um, and, um, and I know the work you do, I know the kind of people you are, and I know um, the uh, wonderful impact that you have in, as was shared today with the, that. I mean, what an awesome thing you did for the, the Navajo people. And I know you're doing stuff like that every day. It's, um, it's tremendous. Um, is it Dave, are you Dave as well? Dave was talking about football and uh, whenever I'm in a group in Cedar City, I have to wonder if there's somebody, if that guy is in the room who uh, knocked me on my hind end um, <laughs> in my first JV football game <laughs> in about 1970, probably. Um, we came up here, there, you know, the Dixie Cedar thing, uh, it was right, it was at its height at that time. Well, maybe it's, the, the bigger height of that was maybe in the 50s and 60s, but it was still, uh, burning pretty bright, and I was this uh, wide-eyed, um, uh, newly, uh, I, I, I made the JD football team, and I, we came to Cedar City to play, and um, I think that um, whoever your coach was uh, on the JD team uh, had told one guy on their team that that's your man on the kickoff, and um, we, uh, we kicked off to Cedar, and I started down the field, and then, uh, and then I don't remember what happened. <laughs> and it might have been one of you guys in this room. <laughs> anyway, uh, I I played a few more games that year in JV, and then I was going to so many rodeos that my. Um, coach or football coach because I would show back up at football practice limping or you know shoulder dislocated or whatever it might be and he would say okay Lyman you you got to make a decision here it's either football or rodeo and that's where I made that decision and I um, I rodeo all I, I left football behind uh, that season and and went on to a much more uh, um, physically, uh, actually a much easier physically, physical sport than football because I never, never experienced anything as traumatic as that hit on the field here. <laughs> in rodeo, I, I rode bulls, I rode barebacks, I rode saddle broncs, and 
I steer wrestled, we, we, we team roped, we roped calves, we did everything, and I did it all the way through college, but nothing ever happened to me quite as traumatic as that hit on the football field. Um, so that I diverged there and I apologize, except that, that you brought that theme up, Dave. So. <laughs> and I, I had to bring up the old Cedar Dixie rivalry as well. I was, I was in a um, meeting the other night with a boy with a, a kid that I grew up with in my in my old neighborhood in St. George, uh, a kid who grew up and became very successful in business and defected and came to Cedar City and became your mayor, Joe Burgess. And um, he, he's a boyhood friend of me. He's a little older than me, but he was one of those neighborhood guys that I always looked up to. And we had a great visit about Cedar City and Dixie and, and how, how real and how um, um, intense that all was, but how we're all now just great Southern Utahns and we're all pulling together. Yeah, we always did, but that rivalry was really, was really awesome and, and really, really, I mean, quite frankly, a lot of fun. It was, it was tremendous. But it, it was great to visit with Joe and to talk about Cedar City and to talk about St. George and to compare notes and, um, and, and just get a sense of, of, of where we are now compared to where we were 40 or 50 years ago. And it's, it's amazing. Um, my wife is a graduate of SVU and she holds this town and this, this school and this, all of this very, very, very dear to her heart. Those were some of the best years of her life at Southern Utah University. She got her teaching certificate here and, and has relationships that are that are life that are lifelong, and uh, <clears throat> so today I wanted to um, I, I wanted to share with you a little bit about who we are and what we are in Zion. And Dave, I don't have my watch on, and I know we prop tell me do we have ten minutes? About Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes left. So give me a high sign, will you? Um, we, uh, the, the Zion Natural History Association was founded clear back in 1929. At least we can trace our roots back to that time when the people in Springdale began to um, come together and uh, create materials for the visitors who were coming to the park at that time. And they would sell um, booklets, information booklets or postcards or other types of interpretive uh, materials to the visitors. They would take the money that they earned from that and put it back into other uh, educational and interpretive and, and uh, products that they could then sell. And the idea was to enhance the visitor experience, but at the same time, make a little bit of money and then be able to support the park in different ways with that money. And they did that, and they did it in the tens and twenties of dollars in those days. And that organization grew and grew over the decades. And then in, uh, by, by the sixties, they were doing it in more in the thousands of dollars. And by the seventies, in the fifty thousands of dollars. And then by the eighties, it was approaching of more than a million dollars a year that um, they were they, they were doing in in business, and then being able to take the profits and give money back to the park for different um, projects. So in the in the nineteen eighties, the organization evolved a little further and be, and went from being kind of a ma and pa group to a, a professional. Um, professionally run organization, uh, a 501c3 nonprofit that worked in partnership with the park. So they were able to operate in the park in a federal uh, facility and with a federal agency, but operate like a private business. And slightly different than the concessionaire. The concessionaires are a different story and the, the, the concessionaires are, are uh, contractors 
who contract with the park and run the lodging and the uh, uh, restaurants and food services and, and that sort of thing. But our organization was a partner organization. And so we worked in the same building with the park service. We, um, we, uh, we worked on, on uh, specific projects that would, um, that would benefit the park. And all of our profits would go back to the park as opposed to a contractor that pays a percentage and operates in the park. So those two models still exist in the park and we're, we're the nonprofit partner and then uh, Zantera is the, um, the uh, a big multinational corporation that runs, that has the uh, concession contract in the park. And so uh, in the 80s, we, we, we got to um, uh, almost $2 million a year in, in revenue that we were generating, which meant that we were able to get a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year back to the park to support things like the Junior Ranger program, to support things like the uh, park newspaper, which was handed, is, still is handed out free at the gate. And the, the kinds of things that kind of created a margin of excellence in the park that could not be funded through federal funding. Number one, uh, because it, it just didn't fit in, the, in, in that definition. But number two, because the, um, the, the legislature or the um, Congress was not allocating enough money to the parks to do those kinds of things. So in the, uh, I, began, I became involved with Zion Natural History Association in the late 80s. And then in, um, the, uh, when we sold St. George Magazine in 1998, I applied for and became the executive director 22 years ago. And we've since then um, grown from about a hundred or about a million and a half dollars a year to last year our budget was almost nine million dollars. And we, our organization actually has a larger annual budget than the park, than Zion National Park itself, because we do all the retailing in the park and we do the fundraising and we're we're generating. Um, what is now closer to a million and a half to two million dollars a year that goes back into the park to fund uh, different things that are needed there, including, as you might have noticed in the media a week or so ago, um, the restoration of the Mill Emerald Pools Trail, which has been closed for 10 years because of landslides and, and uh, different issues. And um, that was a million dollar project. And we worked with the Eccles Foundation and with the National Park Foundation and with local fundraising. And we played that role in bringing all of that together for that to, to happen. And we're working on those kinds of projects all the time. And as I was sharing with uh, David today, we're, our, our work and our influence ex extends beyond Zion National Park and it includes Cedar Breaks National Monument, as well as um, Pipe Spring National Monument. And over the last four or five years, we've been involved um, very intimately with Cedar Breaks National Monument and with in, in every way that we can to help bring about a new uh, visitor center at Cedar Breaks. And this is a, this is a, uh, um, rendering of what that visitor center will look like. If you, you see, you see down below the, uh, the great, the old CCC cabin, which is currently the visitor center. It's about 800 square feet. And we have, we have our, our park store in that building along with the, uh, the, uh, information and the, the ranger and all of that. But Cedar Breaks is a place that uh, that if there's any uh, park or monument in the whole park system that deserves a nice visitor center at Cedar Breaks. But over the last 10 to 15 years, the Park Service has not been building new visitor centers. They're not investing in them. They're not, they're, they're 
um, there's there's not the money there, there's not the um, commitment there to do that. But here in Cedar City, um, those of you who knew Paul Roland, who was the, the previous uh, superintendent at Cedar Breaks, and now Kathleen Gonder, who's the current uh, superintendent, they are really being um, proactive in helping move this forward to, to create a truly meaningful and wonderful uh, uh, site and visitor contact at Cedar Breaks. Many of you remember the 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 lot the old lodge there, and you lament the fact that that's gone. And I, I know I've heard people share that that's just gut wrenching for them to think that that all of that wonderful uh, story and history is is not there anymore. But what what we what we hope to be able to do um, is to begin breaking ground this spring on this new visitor center. We still have quite a bit of money to raise. It's about a six to seven million dollar project. And we're working with a matching grant with the National Park Foundation through the National Park um, Centennial Grant. And we have, we, when we signed on to raise money for this, um, four or five years ago, we thought we were gonna to need to, to raise a million dollars. And at that time, that was just off the charts for us to even imagine doing that. Well, we now need to raise about three million, but we're, uh, well, we have already raised well over two million. And uh, to go toward the matching, the three million that the Centennial Grant will match. And so we're, we're, we're winding our way down now with our fundraising and the efforts that we've made over the last four or five years to where we're actually feeling like we're, we're gonna get there. <laughs>